You should have seen what he said, no. Even then, you see a control of basically, a, a sense of respect for, for the family. And this means that we have to model this. I begin this with myself. To my parents who are alive, if I ever show disrespect to them, especially in front of my children, I can never ask for respect from my children when I have not shown it to my parents. Are you, are you getting that? So that's what's happening now, is that our children are watching the, this thing about respect unfold, and they're basically saying that how my, my, my mom and dad treat their parents as they get old is how we will have to treat them. And when that is done well, it happened in the, in the company of the Prophet Some people were there, some elderly people were trying to get an audience with the Prophet and the other younger people sort of pushed them aside or didn't give them the path, didn't give them the way, and the Prophet said, about that, that them, the one person, yuwakir kabiran, the one person who doesn't give tawkir, honor to our older, walam yarham sagiran, that one who doesn't show rahma to our young, falaysa minna. See, he went so far as to say, that person, he didn't say, we, some people always jump and say, this is kafir. No, this is saying he's not from among us. Because when you stay with us, you develop the adab of our gathering. You understand how we function. You understand for the elders we give rights, we give them the leeway. We, we say to them, even though you're not from here, we know that you know the principles of what it means to be a human being and to raise children, and, and, and on and on and on. And that's what he showed. The love, the respect was consistent and constant, subhanAllah. And this is something that we have to think about. Number three, as parents, believe me, we are in a generation now where our parents struggled forever to save. And then they barely got something for themselves. I don't remember my mother talking about new outfits ever. I'm sure she had them because somehow they were outfits that she had as she became older, but never something where there was a shopping spree or a shopping list or I'm depressed and we're gonna go shopping. And this is like a conversation that goes on now. This third point is about delaying gratification. Delaying what we want. Can we say to ourselves honestly, because we say that to children <laughs> all the time, you want this now, no, 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 wait. Wait till you're ready. Wait till you see you know, the value of this, value of money. But the children look at them, and they look at us. And they say, Dad, you were coming home the other day, and you called Mom, and you showed up in the driveway with a brand new HD TV that's like 50,000 feet big. Our home isn't 50,000 feet, but you bought it. No one discussed it. No one talked about it. I don't remember anybody discussing it. You saw it. You took it. You didn't delay any gratification. What signal does it send? It sends them that. There's a set of rules and laws for you, and a set of rules and laws for how I operate, or how mother operates. However, if we say to the kids, we really need a new car, but our car is decent, it's working well, we're not going to compromise safety, but if we need it, inshallah we're going to save up, and all of us will save up to buy this new car, or to get this new thing. When we show them that, this is the example of the akhirah being much better than the present. And this was the life of the Prophet all the time. All the time, the Akhirah that Allah SWT tells him throughout the Quran, do you know the Akhirah is better for you than the present? But unfortunately, we're getting into a situation where we are looking at ourselves and saying, well, my mom and dad sacrificed so much, now I, can, I have the salary at the age 40 that my dad had to wait till the age 70. So why do I have to wait to get what I want? Let me just get it now. Why do I have to deprive my children? No, we're not saying to don't give your children good things. But let's be proportional. Let's realize that they don't have to have the best of every single thing. They don't. They can learn. Now, for example, Omar, uh, Ahmed is six years old. Omar is 10. Clearly, there's a age difference. So the outfits that fit Omar, that my wife liked and saved, are there in another room. So Ahmed actually knows that he, when he grows out of something, can go shopping in that room. Did you understand what I just said? He goes shopping in that room. Everything is arranged for him. He knows where the t-shirts are. He knows where the pants are, where the shorts are, where the long sleeve shirts are. But that's what he does. You, you understand what I'm saying here? Somehow we got the idea that I want to be better than what my parents did. But I'm telling you, I have the stories and stories that I travel. Medical doctor tells me that when they had little money, he and his wife used to save coupons enough to take their children and walk because they didn't have a car to this local pizza shop or something because they had enough coupons to save enough money now, the same medical doctor, thousands of dollars to the masjid. Tens of relatives he sponsored. 
And they come in, they stay in this full finished basement where I stayed, they stay there for months. When they, and they have uh, uh, part-time jobs. As they get enough money to get their first apartment, they move out of that house, get the apartment, and he has a cycle going. He must have sponsored up to 30 relatives this way. Documented, in case this is recorded, uh, documented immigration, right? He brings them in legally through paperwork and everything. <laughs> and, no, I, mean, I just want to be sure they understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I mean, I might be, yeah, I'm not crazy, I know, I know. So documented, 30 different people coming in, getting jobs and moving on, because he can do that. It happened in the life of the Prophet At the, time, the moment I mentioned with you when he was, had uh, uh, disagreements with his wife, wives, and he was there alone lying down, Umar ibn Khattab who sought company, sought his company. And when he was granted the company, he went, and as the Prophet sat up from lying down, Umar ibn Khattab saw that the, the, the cloth which he was covering his shoulder had fallen slightly. And he looked at his back and he saw marks. He saw marks on his back and it brought this man who is the strength of many men who shaitan would run the other way. He looked and he was, he was crying saying, Ya Rasulullah, tell us and we'll get you that which the kings of Persia and the Romans and others have. Tell us, why do you live like this? You have marks on your back. Marks on your back. And the Prophet told him that for them is this dunya. And for us is the Akhirah. Doesn't that please you, Ya Umar? Doesn't that please you? And he said, Radid, yeah, I'm pleased with that response. Meaning that these marks are nothing compared to what is waiting for us in the afterlife. And believe me, if we do that for our children, I'm convinced that they will see it. When you struggle with that same thing and you're working with it and you're not just buying new things all the time and when you even, you know, delaying your own gratification. Number four and five, and I'll close very quickly so we can have a conversation, inshallah, is really, and this is myself, always the reminders are to myself first and then to my brothers and sisters, is the, 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 in raising the children, the control of the tongue and speech in our interactions as husband and wife, and especially interactions with the children. Believe me, believe me. You know, there's a saying when we're growing up, uh, sticks, and, sticks and stones may break my bones, right? But words may, will never hurt It's wrong. Very wrong, very wrong, because the body is strong enough that Allah Qadar Allah, should someone be injured by a stone or a stick, that will heal. But words stick in the, in the, in the imprint, and they're imprinted into, in the mind of a child like something you've never known before. We have no evidence of the Prophet ﷺ ever losing his temper in a way that he lost control of his speech. That he said, let alone verbal, physical, psychological, mental, neglect, emotional, any kind of abuse. And we're saying, that we should come to a point in our homes, in our, in our, in our, you know, in terms of our, our raising our children, that we actually look and very carefully say, are we doing things that actually show a disrespect of the religion? A father can do that when the mother reminds him of salah, and he says, you know, the game. In that, in doing that, from the reaction, the child says that this tongue is loose. In, a, in order that we have the expression that we say, the loose tongue. Like, what does that mean? It basically means that it's out of control, like it's not in your control. By saying things, by the way we say things, and subhanAllah, this is something that we should think about, and this goes to everything. Lying, gossiping, backbiting, these are things that are not in control. The tongue is not in control. Simple things, the phone rings, you're at home. The child happens to answer the phone, and you say to them, tell them I'm, I'm not home. I'm not home. <laughs> the child says, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You just picked me up from Sunday school and the lesson was not lying. Imam Shadi is here. Maybe he was talking about don't, don't be a kadhab, don't be a liar. And then the kid goes home and the parents tell them I'm not home. But you're right there. In fact, if you watch, the kids will do it. He's standing in front of me but he told me to say you're not home. <laughs> that's, the, that's the American child. That's the American, that's the American child. They'll do that and you'll be like, what is wrong with you? Say, Nothing is wrong with me. You're the one. <laughs> so one of the scholars said, if you're going to do that, then leave, leave physically the room, go to another room, and then you can say to the child, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> Did you hear me? <laughs> tell them I'm not here. Right? Of course, now with caller ID, you know who's calling. So if you don't feel like talking to them at the time, just don't answer the phone. Right? Not like the brother who was praying, the Imam told me it actually happened, doesn't know his technology, the phone rang. And the poor guy didn't know the technology, the phone rang, 
and he was in tashahud, they were praying sunnah, he was in tashahud, he got nervous and he slapped his, uh, his uh, pocket to turn it off and he hit the speakerphone. The wife doesn't hear him answering. Hello, hello, are you there? Hello. Now the whole masjid is hearing the conversation. <laughs> but he can't respond because he's in tashahud. So he is actually, and the imam is watching him and he does this. He says, in tashahud. I'm in tashahud. <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't want her to call 911 thinking something happened to him because he answered his phone. But I mean, we're going to learn this. We're going to get through it as a community. We're going to inshallah get through it. But it's going to take some doing. It's not going to be easy. But we have to be aware and ready, you know, in terms of, in terms of what's needed. So we, we need to really be, you know, be, uh, be, be cognizant of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Rasulullah as an example for all situations. For all situations. There was not an instance where, in fact, his name, and I talked to the youth at uh, Al Huda before we came, the name before even he became Prophet was what? As Sadiqul Amin, SubhanAllah. Imagine people who then became your worst enemies. They never said, we're going to take that title away from him. Did they ever do that? In fact, when he was doing the Hijrah to Medina, what was one of the things that were worrying him? Give back, give back the property, the mal of those who had lent it to him. What does that tell you? That even after he was Prophet Wasallam, that they, had, they didn't take it back. They kept it. They kept it. And SubhanAllah, there's so much more that could be said. And the last thing in, in closing, and I mentioned this at the other lecture, so I think it's valuable for us, is that among the challenges we have is to raise a, a children uh, uh, without any sense of history. And I'll stop there and we can talk, inshallah. Without any sense of history. This is a challenge. Because we're so caught up in being ourselves and moving ahead, moving ahead, sometimes we want to forget things. They need to know the Islamic history, the lessons. They need to know the Muslim American history, even the founding of the Unity Center. Some of the, every young generation should do the research with every founder, then the next generation, so that it can become a part of their life that they, did. they weren't just born and a masjid came. That's how we grow. We used to ride 45 minutes to a masjid from one suburb to another. I'm sure you did the same thing until these massages came up. They have to know that history. And number three, they have to know their family history. They have to know who their parents are, grandparents are, relatives are. That way it forces you and I about uh, uh, forgiveness. Because you can't have a missing box and say, that's the uncle we don't talk to. You can't. You have to say who that uncle is. I am witness to the fact that we were attending a janazah and I heard one young man calling home to his mom saying, yeah, I made it to the janazah. And she, and she must have asked, is so-and-so of your relative there? And he said, he's here, but he didn't say salams to me, so I didn't say salams to him. I heard it this way. The family history is critical. They have to know where they came from, who their grandparents were, especially if they made sacrifices of the hijrah and subhanAllah came to this country and may, maybe, maybe even uh, buried close by here. But they have to know that history. So I'll stop there in terms of these things, inshallah. And uh, I'll engage you in, 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 I'm sure, lessons for, that I can take back to my, my wife and, uh, and our own children. And uh, any comments and questions you have, any, any other observations, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan for the attention, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. So what do you do at Unity Center? Do you raise hands to ask questions? or? It's not fundraising, so don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah, now I started doing more fundraising because of just the number, the need, and people get like, uh, this is a lecture, this is not fundraising, then they relax, right? So any comments, any observations from what I've said, something you want to expand on? Any questions? Yes? What would be the role of family in protecting their kids from the outside uh, effect that is around them? You know, there's the, we have yeah, yeah. Islamic, atmosphere, yeah. but then you have the TV, you yeah. have the public school, you have so many outside effects, and yeah. then you cannot isolate them. You yeah. can't put them in a clean room. Right. So what do you do? So this means that uh, you have to spend quality time with them. They have to be able to trust that they can come to you with any topic, and I mean that. And they have to be able to know that they can have a conversation with you that's real. And what this means for us is that car trips are an amazing therapy place. Amazing. Radio is not on. No private DVD players in the back seats. No mom is on one cell phone, dad is on another cell phone, complaining to each parent about the other in the same car. If we turn off everything, 
then the kids will actually look out the window and say, you know what? You know what they said at school today? They said that the people who uh, did that thing in Boston, they're Muslims. Did you know that, mom and dad? What do you think about that? And suddenly you have to engage them because they know things. They actually heard that. They, they, now you have to talk about it. Our challenge is that I think sometimes we're scared about the things they'll ask us, so we keep them busy. Basically, if we keep them busy, maybe that will be the best thing because then hopefully, and the problem is, if they don't talk to you about it, they will talk to someone. And you hope to Allah that that person they talk to is either the Imam or somebody in the community who is a, an elder, somebody who can say, you know what, yeah, let's have this conversation. So my thing is the deconstruction space, space where they can sit and say, you know what, I feel this. You know, I don't think it's unreal for us to say that some kids are going to come home and say, you know what, if people from our religion are doing this, I don't want to be a part of it. I can see this coming. It's not so far away. And we have to be able to say, not get upset about them and say, I knew we should have never moved to America. It's like 50 years too late, right? That was yesterday's conversation. You're already here. You are an American. And these are your American kids telling you that if these people say that do this in my faith, I don't want to be a part of it. We say no. And we do this all the time. Some people do this, but that's not a part of our religion. That's not a part of what we believe in. And if they do it this way, this is another way that you can do. For example, if you're upset about something, I mentioned to the kids in Huda, write letters to the editor. Give a speech in class about it in terms of a research paper. I mean, don't start and give a khutbah, but when you have a, re, you know, a project presentation, choose a topic about your religion. Educate the people. That would be the way to go about it. And never st stun them with disbelief. Even if you have to show disbelief, figure out the, dis the non-disbelief face when they say something so that they don't go, did you see his face? Because they talk. My sons are 10 and 6. I, I walk in on them sometimes to, 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 to do my uh, uh, shafan with it at night when, there's, you know, when I think they're asleep, but sometimes they're awake talking to each other. And they're telling each other about things that happened during the day. And they will remember how, you said, did you see her, her face, mom's face when I told her that? And they'll say, oh, so those things we don't tell mom. You see that? Or those things we don't tell dad, because dad, right, in terms of, they don't even know electric city, but they know a short fuse, <laughs> right? And dad has a short fuse, right? He doesn't think before he speaks. So how are we going to do that, right? So I, I would say that space is really important. And we're doing this a lot in our home. The kids have, and I'm very frank, and you can call them now, 20 minutes of video time a week. 20 minutes of video time a week. That gives a lot of time to talk about everything. Everything. And it's draining to be a parent in 21st century America, because if you don't have the stamina, I say to you, Make dua to Allah that other people have children because if you don't have the stamina, you're not, you shouldn't be having children in that sense because it's beyond just delivery and I have the insurance so they paid for it. You have to raise them for the rest of their life and they will drain every energy. And that's Now I appreciate what the Prophet said, take advantage of your free time before you become busy. <laughs> now I know what busy is. My wife is like 10 times busy. So hopefully that's some, some help to you. Anything else? Yes? As a Muslim living in the West, um, do you think that it may be better to bring kids through Islamic schools or regular schools? Um, if yes, up to what age? So, SubhanAllah, we ended the other session with this question about schooling. And I'll be frank with you, my wife and I, it's a very family decision. Each individual family. My wife and I are homeschooling. My, well, I should say my wife is homeschooling. So she's the principal of the school. I'm the person who cleans and takes care of things. But she's there. And uh, if that's the stamina that you have, then do that. If the public school system is supplemented by people, like I said, your imams and local people who have a structured weekend program, and there's a space for that, then that's what we could do. If it means uh, the Islamic schools, and you have a f functioning Islamic school, and I emphasize functioning Islamic school, Islamic school is not a Muslim person who has some time who can be the principal, right? We, we're, we're past that, right? Okay, so then that's, a, that's something. And if you can't, if they can go to a private school because that's what's available, but you can supplement it, then that's what they should do. I think the biggest thing is that the education is not just the eight hours of where they physically spend, but it's the, what happens at home with the information they gain or acquire. And as I was mentioning there, sometimes the parents can undo what an Islamic school does for eight hours in the 15 minutes that they pick up their kids. By the things they talk about on the phone, the stuff they're listening to on the radio, the gossiping that's going on, whatever, the kids are like, I don't even know what they're talking about. 
right? So I would say at this point in America, I don't know if we can pull out every kid from public school and say, because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the trained people. Maybe 20 years from now we have a different answer. But then in Virginia where I live, the, the homeschooling movement is massive. Massive, mashallah, tabarakallah. They have their own co-op, they have uh, science, they have you know uh, English, math, everything. The hips of the, the Quran, everything. Some of them are learning it online with scholars from Egypt and Pakistan and other places. That's the Quran memorization. Others are doing it you know, in, in person. So it's very manageable. But we have to make them the priority. I think, Allah Alam, that those of us who are of my age now, that were in the, raised in the 80s, we're like, just by the mercy of Allah, we happen to come through. That's all I can say. I mean, literally, in the dua of the elders, because outside of that, I know of my people of my age group who I don't know where they are. And that's not a good place to be for us. Definitely a good place to be. Yes? Continuation of the previous topic. I mean, Allah like, one thing like, how long you protect them, whether it's at home schooling or Islamic schooling. Sooner or later, these kids are going to go out into universities, colleges, in the workplaces, they will get exposed. Now, I mean, with that aspect, how early we should put them into that culture, or how, 